Lord Jesus, we come to you today with hearts full of gratitude and love for the way in which you express your love for us. Lord, you created this universe and everything in it, including us, for your purposes and for your glory. And we ask today, God, that our lives would reflect that glory back to this world and back to you. We're so grateful for the opportunities that we have to gather each and every week in a warm sanctuary with family and friends that we love to worship and praise you. Lord, we're, we're thoughtful of those around this world who are persecuted for their belief and for their worship of you and ask that your spirit would comfort them and strengthen them and protect them. Lord, we thank you for the many blessings that you offer to us. And yet, Lord, we also think of those in our in our congregation who need a special touch of your healing hand. We think of Jack Larson, Kathy Gumate, Jean McCormick, and Buster Pate. We ask that you would send your spirit to bring them comfort and healing and rest. And Lord, we ask that you would continue to move in the hearts of anyone, Lord, who needs to know that they are loved by you and by others. Father, we lift all these prayers to you, knowing that you hear them, because we bring them to you in the name of your Son, who when asked how should we pray, taught us this prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our scripture this morning comes from uh, four different books of the scriptures. The first one is from the book of Micah, chapter 6, verse 8. And it reads this way. He has shown you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. And then from Psalm 25, verses 8 and 9. Good and upright is the Lord, therefore he instructs sinners in his ways. He guides the humble in what is right and teaches them his way. And John 14, 1 through 3, Jesus says, Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My Father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I am going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you with to be with me, that you also may be where I am. And then Ephesians 2, verses 8-10. through 10. God saved you by His grace when you believed. And you can't take credit for this. It is a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done, so none of us can boast about it, for we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus, so we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. Will you pray with me for Pastor Mike as he comes to share the message this morning? Lord God, your servant Pastor Mike has labored this week upon these words, but Lord, we know that your spirit has prompted these words, Lord, in his heart, and we know that you will speak through him. We ask today, Lord, that our ears and hearts would also be prompted by your spirit, that, me, that we might receive these words, and that our lives might change. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to stay in the box today just to see if I can really do it. <laughs> um, you know, I kind of heard the tail end of what Keith was saying. Um, I've known Tony Nestor for a long time, too. He's been a colleague of mine. Ten bucks per fact about Keith Nestor that you want to know. And to the building fund. No, we're really looking forward to uh, having Tony here in a couple weeks. Fantastic preacher. Um, you will see part of where uh, Keith got his uh, rich openings uh, to faith in when, when Tony and his dad's here. And um, we get to, to move today towards the, the closure of this uh, sermon series, Because We Believe. Now, I don't think that the work of this sermon series ever uh, closes. Um, and next week, um, your, your church um, 
Uh, council chairperson, one of your youth, and I will be leading a discussion uh, here as a sermon uh, together, and we look forward to that uh, on the Because We Believe. Um, and, and for today, we're going to say, we're going to look at how a disciple practices gospel centered hospitality and humility. That's not sunset. Well, that's cool. I heard Simon had his fun up here with you, so um, I'm glad. It's my favorite scene. There it is. I, I, I loved what Simon said, how, how this brings some softness and a different feel to, to our uh, historic architect. I love that, but that's not really what I want to talk about. This is what I want to talk about. Humility begins with yielding yourself to God. That, that's where humility starts. You know, I, I say all the time, I watch football. I, I, that's okay with me. A couple weeks ago, I was watching an NFL game, and, and number 68 was the defensive tackle, and they ran a play, a power play at him. And I'll tell you what, the guard that was blocking him knocked him 15 yards off the ball. And the announcer said, wow, number 68 was completely humiliated on that play. And, and he was. Not only was he humiliated by, by getting knocked away from the ball, but they showed it to us several times to a national TV audience. And I tell you this, I don't know number 68 in the least little bit, but that was not a humility he chose, right? That was not a humility he chose. Now, obviously, when we say that humility begins with yielding yourself to God, obviously the Lord could humble you. He's the creator of all things. He's the master of all power. He has complete domain over everything, and he could extinguish us. He could push us back. He could make us feel terrible. He could humble you because he is so great and majestic and powerful, and we are so small. Think about it this way. Hundreds of us can fit in this room. Only one of him can fit in the entire universe. That's the size of our God. And he could choose to humble us. But the fact of the matter is this is that disciples themselves are to choose humility. Over and over and over again in the scriptures it says, humble yourself in the sight of the Lord. Humble yourself. That's why the prophet Micah says these words. He has shown you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God? Now, when we say that a person is to act justly, what it simply means is this. Don't make it harder than it is. Is to seek not to hurt others or have advantage in, uh, over them. In our daily lives, is to actually act justly. Is to not try to make others feel worse just for having come into contact with us. To not try to gain an advantage or leverage over them. That is not justice. Justice is to seek not to hurt others and to not have advantage over them. And to love mercy means simply this, to treat others kindly. See, I could stand up here all morning long and I have ability to do that. To have the argument between fair and mercy. What is fair versus what is merciful? And I'll tell you this. If given the choice between having a fair deal and having mercy cast upon you, take mercy every time. Because mercy is more beneficial to us all than fairness. And the Christian is to love mercy and to walk humbly with our God. You see, your living, when we say, when the prophet Micah says, walk humbly with your God, your living should make it clear that God is your God. Anybody that looks upon you should be able to look at you and say, well, that person doesn't believe that they created themselves. They believe that they have a creator that is the God above all things, and before even they were formed in their mother's womb, God put them together, something not only through the biological pieces, but something spiritual is happening in that one, and they look up all day long, giving thanks to a creator that is not them, that there is a greater engineer in the world than them, that there is a greater power in the world, and they believe that God sustains their daily life. That while they have skills and abilities, while they have intellect and opportunity, it is God that sustains them from this day to another. God is the spirit that runs in their lives, that allows them to be the person that they are. And they believe that they did not redeem themselves. Their value did not come from themselves. They are sinners, broken and hurting, and only God's power alone can wash them off, make them their soul clean without any dark blot, and redeem their spirit. You see, this is what a Christian should do. 
When we walk humbly with our God, our living should make clear that God is our God. Does it? Does your living every single day make clear that you are a believer in God and that God is your God? So often I have watched Christians walk in front of God. God, do as I would like. Here's my list of things I need you to do today, God. But that's not what the scripture tells us to do. It says to walk humbly and obediently with God at the side of God, or maybe even behind God, so that when God gives his beck and call, we work on the mission that God has in front of us. Our obedience is to him. His obedience is not to us. Humility begins with yielding yourself to God. And then it progresses to this. Humility allows us to see the value that God places on all. This is important for Christians to understand. Because this is antithetical to the values of our culture. That all people are valuable? Think about this. Everything that you see in television, every ad that you see on the internet or in your papers, almost the majority of conversations that I hear in coffee shops and around say this. You are really, really important. You are the sun and everything else in the world is the planet. Everything revolves and rotates around you. You are the most important thing. And I will tell you this. That kind of thinking has overcome our cultural, our culture, and is antithetical to the way of God. And the outcome of us believing that we're the most important thing that ever lived upon the earth, that we're the center of all creation, is this. Broken minds. And there are many of them in our culture whose mind is so broken because they think they're the most important. And when things don't work out, they say, how can this happen? Predatory behavior will just infiltrate the culture. We have that, don't we? And people will be isolated from each other. You heard Pastor Keith talk about that last week. See, if you don't value everyone, and you're the most important thing, all these things happen. That's why in Psalm 25, David writes this. Good and upright is the Lord. Therefore, he instructs his sinners in his ways. He guides the humble in what is right and teaches them his way. Now, look carefully. All all eyes and ears up here. You are the apple of God's eye. You are of infinite value and worth. You were created specifically and independently to be you, and you have the touch of God in your spirit, and everyone else is that important too. That's what we've got to get our minds around, is that we are the most important things that God has ever created, and so are the rest of us. See, see, God values all people equally. We've sung the songs that act that say that. We've lived and seen things that would teach us to that, but this is a baseline Christian value, and you cannot miss it, that walking with God in humility opens our eyes to see the value that God places on every person. Therefore, humility leads us to serving God by serving others. See, the humble serve by offering gospel-centered hospitality. Gospel-centered hospitality. Now, now, this is critical to our faith. You can't miss this. Because there are many in our generations who do not feel how important and valued they are by God. Do you understand that? There are millions in our world. There are people, you know, I I was so overcome this week reading a stack of 200 plus prayer cards and praying through them, things that you wrote down last week. And of course, there were all the things that we normally see, struggles with, with health issues and struggles within our families and joys to God, and yet there were many in that stack. It simply pointed to friends, relatives, acquaintances, neighbors of yours who don't know how important they are and valued by God, who don't have a relationship with God. And their lives, though they may have many people around them, are saturated with feelings of isolation 
and loneliness. They don't get how important they are to the Lord. They don't engage in their mind in how significant they are to the Lord. And into this, a disciple of Jesus, and that's me and it's you, offers gospel-centered hospitality. And this is how I believe it pays out, plays out. First, those desiring hospitality have one question. One question. Is there a place for us? Is there a place for me? You see, I would say this, and I've said it many times before in this and other venues, that everyone desires a place. Everyone desires a place that is for them, a safe place, a place where you can be authentically yours, where you can be welcomed and valued. I mean, look at the cinema you know, and everybody here has seen this. What does Dorothy want? In Oz, she clicks her heels together and says, there's no place like home. There's no place like home. There's no place like home because she knew that the place that she was in was not the place where she could be authentic. It wasn't the place for her. She knew that she wanted a place and it wasn't where she is. And thousands and millions in our culture have no place. And they're clicking their heels together as hard as they can. And they can't find it. Years ago, and I'm not talking about in the 40s or 60s. I'm talking about in the mid-80s. My friend Aaron Gray and I were in Salt Lake City for some United Methodist meeting. That was part of our conference there, and we were at a church. And We'd gone to breakfast early at Jack's. Jack's breakfast special, $1.99 for all the waffles, hash browns, and eggs, and coffee you can eat. Now, this is 80s prices, so that was still a good deal. So Aaron and I went into Jack's. And we sat down at 7.30 in the morning. We had to be at the meeting by 9. Aaron is African-American from inner city Denver. He's one of my best friends. 7.30, we sat down. It was a seat yourself kind of place. 7.45, we had neither gotten menus or glasses, but we didn't need any. We just wanted to order Jack's breakfast special for $1.99, all the pancakes, hash browns, eggs, and coffee you can have. At 8.30, no one had stopped, even though Pastor Mike had many times said, excuse me, miss, 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 literally even standing up at one time. And about 10 after 8, a young man, also African American, walked out of the dishwashing room, leaned over to my friend's ear, said something to him. He nodded his head. The kid went back into the dish room, and then he said, Brother Morgan, we need to go. I said, what do you mean? He says, that boy came out here and said, doesn't matter how long you sit there, sir, these people aren't ever going to serve you. And I said, I ain't going anywhere. I'm going to tear them down, then I'm going to burn it up. He says, you don't understand, Mike. This is the first time it's ever happened to you. All you need to know is this is not my place. And if it's not my place and you're my friend, then it's not your place either. We wanted a place. We were just denied a place. See, we ask ourselves all the time, and people in our culture and our world ask themselves, is there a place for me? Is there a place where I am welcome? Is there a place where I am wanted? Is there a place where I am valuable? And that's what I believe gospel-centered hospitality is this, that we, with all of our spirit, with all of our heart, with everything that we got, we stomp our feet, we raise our hands, and we say, there is such a place. There is absolutely such a place For all people, of all times, of all kinds. And our hospitality is not entertaining. It's not simply just entertaining. Oh, how I love to entertain. Don't you love having people at your house? Last Sunday night, Teresa and I were having some of my friends over, one of my college roommates and his wife. And we love Tammy and Kevin. But oh my gosh. The preparations for entertaining, I had to dust everything, vacuum everything. I'm raking the carpet, you know. We're, we're, we're making sure the cake's right, the grill's the right temperature. It was a lot of work, but it was worth it to get ready for one of my better friends to come over for dinner. But hospitality's not that. Hospitality's not entering, not just entertaining. It's way more than that. It's crying out. It's crying out with our heart, our mind, our spirit, our souls. This is the place. This is the place for you. And here's why we're right. See, there's a story in Acts chapter 8. Read it when you get home today. Philip is walking around down the road. He's put there by the Lord. And there's an Ethiopian eunuch in a chariot. Now, the Ethiopian eunuch had a couple things not going for him. 
First of all, he was African, so that meant he was very black, different color than everyone in Israel. He was a eunuch, which meant he couldn't uh, procreate. He wasn't going to extend his family line, and he was a servant of the, king, of the queen. He had no place in society. He couldn't go to worship with, with, in the Hebrews. He could not be with people. He was left by himself. There was literally, literally no place for him. And as Philip comes up, he can see he's reading the scriptures. He's reading the scriptures, and it's talking about how there is a place in, 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 he's reading the scriptures in Isaiah, and, and Peter, and Philip says to him, do you know what those scriptures mean? And he says, how could I without a guide? And Philip climbs upon his chariot and tells him the good news of Christ that indicates to him that there's a place for him and everyone to come behind him. All he needs to do is repent and be baptized. And the eunuch says, There is water seen a pond or a river. What is to prevent me from being baptized? And Philip says, nothing. And in the 2014 paraphrase of of this scripture, he says, let's get down, let's get wet. Let's get down, let's get wet. Because from that moment on, the eunuch knew that there was always a place for him. And you see, the good news of Jesus Christ is this. I am the place. I am the place. We think of structures and buildings and all of those kind of things. But the Lord Jesus Christ says, I am the place and I am the place for you and everyone before and to come after you. See, our place is a person. Our place is a person that we know as Jesus Christ. That's why in John 14, Jesus said this. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. For my Father's house has many rooms. And if it were not so... What I have told you that I'm going to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me so that where I am, you will be also. See, this is the hospitality of Christ. That's the hospitality of Christ. See, the hospitality of Christ leads with there is room for you. There is room for you. Some of you don't know because you've come along to the church in the last few years, and we're grateful to have you. But I grew up in this church. Before I was a pastor, I was a person in the church. And back in the day when I was a youngster, we had what was called UMYF. Remember that acronym? United Methodist Youth Fellowship, which had its blessings, and it blessed me in many ways. And one of the ways it blessed me with was we had two mentors that led our group named Steve and Kay Troxell. Some of you remember them. Some of you know them. Some of you were shepherded by them. Steve and Kay Troxell, of course, have an elevated position in my heart And years ago, I was traveling to Arizona, and they live in Page, Arizona, and I called the head and said, Steve and Kay, I'd love to come by and spend the night in your home, uh, you know, sit and have fellowship with you and all that kind of stuff. And and, and then I got delayed and delayed and delayed and delayed, a couple different days of delay. And I remember calling Steve on the phone, and I was very sheepish because I think I was supposed to be there on Monday and I was going to get there on Friday. And Steve said this. He said, Mike, whenever you come... We have room for you. Whenever we come, you come. We have room for you. And the Lord Jesus Christ says to you and everybody everywhere, whenever you come to me, whenever you come to me, there is room for you. You can come in the morning. You can come at night. You can come 20 years after I thought you would come. But whenever you come, there is room for you. And this is the hospitality of Christ. And the hospitality of Christ continues on in John 14 and says there is a specific place for you. Your specific place is prepared. Back when Teresa and I and the girls used to go camping all the time, we were on a trip up to North Michigan, and we stopped in Chicago, and I, I had made reservations on, 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 at a campground. That was before the Internet was really circular and all that sort of thing. Al Gore hadn't finished that all up yet. And so... <laughs> telling it the way I heard it. All right. So it wasn't done, so we called ahead, and we made a reservation. We made a reservation at a KOA campground. And I said, is my place ready for me? Is it secured? The guy said, absolutely, Mr. Morgan. Your place is prepared for you, but. But. There's no but in that question. He says, but be here by 7 o'clock or we give your place away. What Jesus says is the exact opposite. No one can or will take your place. It has always been. It will always be for you, individually and specifically for you. 
And the hospitality of Christ then leads us to understand that our place is together in the Lord. Years ago, our daughters and I, and, and, and Teresa and I went on vacation. We were using, maybe some of you have done this. My, my father-in-law had a condo on West Palm Beach. He wintered there, but we were going in the summer. And so we went down and we asked him if we could use our, his condo because it probably saved us, I don't know, hundreds of dollars uh, a, a night. And we had a great time using the beach and cooking out and hanging out. But Grandma and Grandpa weren't there. And I remember at the end of that time of, of us playing squatters in their condo, we were gathering our stuff up to go down the elevator. And one of my daughters said to me, Dad, this is a fun vacation. But it would have been better if Grandpa would have been here. It's more fun when we're together. And see, that's what the Lord says to us all the time. Our place is together. Together is best. So where you are, I will be. And where I am, you will be. See, Christians hear this. Hospitality is the model for our behavior. I'm not going to take 25 minutes in a hospitality sermon and talk to adults about how you should be nice to people. My goodness sake, you learned that in kindergarten. Just do that. Be nice and welcoming to people. I'm not going to talk for 25 minutes about how we should be welcoming at church because we're part of an eternal community and, and people need a place and there are people groping trying to find a place. Why would I spend sermon time on that when it's something that you already know and just need to activate that? And I'm not going to spend all this time encouraging you to invite people to coffee, to lunch, or to come over to your house because you already know how much joy that brings. You know how much more intimate it is if you get to meet someone personally, or not in a public setting, but in some sort of private setting. So you know it's important to be hospitable and welcoming as a people and a church, and we're way better when we do those things. And we have teams of people working on that things, and I hope you heed to their calls and warnings. But that's not what a sermon is about. Gospel-centered hospitality invites, welcomes, and enjoys life together in his place. Gospel-centered hospitality invites, welcomes, and enjoys life together in his place. See, in Ephesians 2, you remember when we started 40 Days of Purpose, some of you that have been around 10 years? This was one of our baseline scriptures for this. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 10. God saved you by his grace when you believed. And you can't take credit for this. It's a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done, so none of us can boast about it. For we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus, so we can do good things that he planned for us long ago. We don't earn or own our place. We are given it by the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the master of the universe, Jesus Christ himself, and we are to welcome others to that place. See, gospel-centered hospitality is one of the good things he planned for us to do. Gospel-centered hospitality is inviting and welcoming a person to their place. Life with Christ, which incidentally is alongside us in our place, which is life with Christ. So listen, so many people, I mean, this is what keeps me up at night. It actually is what wakes me up to be a pastor Every single day. It's what fuels me as a Christian. There are so many people in Marion, Cedar Rapids, Hiawatha, Robbins, Albernet, wherever it is you live, looking for a place. There are so many people looking for a place and they can't find an entrance. They're groping like blind men along a wall looking for a doorway to go in they're they're looking for a way to get to their place a way to get into their place and hospitality in the christian setting is thinking so much of them because god does that we help them to it we open the door and reach out and say come on in this is the place for you because one thing we know for sure is that there is room for them See, we proclaim by our ministries, but more importantly, we proclaim in the time when we're off the clock. You know, you're on the clock. You 8.30 people, you're on the clock from 8.30 to 9.30. It's your responsibility and opportunity to worship the Lord, to lift his name on high. You came here for that. You better be about that. Don't be planning what you're getting at Arby's. I know you can't go to Chick-fil-A today, Lauren, so you don't have to worry about that, right? Sorry, she loves Chick-fil-A. It's her life goal to own one. Um, It just comes. I'm just making this stuff up. All right. <laughs> Amen. 
But, but, but see, what, what, what we have to remind ourselves is that there's so many people that, that need a place, and we have to be able, in our living, by that that's close to us. We don't have to go to Haiti or Africa to, 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 to tell people, there's a place for you. Wherever and however you come. See, I've had so many people tell me in my life, it's too late, Mike. I've lived such a cruddy life, man. I smoke weed all the time. I drink all the time. I've run around on my wife. And I say, it's not too late. It doesn't matter if you're a kid at summer games or if you're a 95-year-old that we're baptizing out at Willow Gardens because I've done both. It doesn't matter. It's never too late to come to Christ. However you come, whenever you come, your life situation doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if you're divorced or single. It doesn't matter if you're a kid or an older person. It doesn't matter what your inclination, your orientations, or your situation is. Your, that does not matter. What matters is that there's room for you and that we as Christians communicate that to the entire world we come in contact with. We say to the people that are groping around looking for a place to say there's a place for you and there's room for you. And we also can tell them that your specific place is prepared. It's for them and only them. They are specifically who God had in mind. Yes, biology made them. Yes, the spirit was in them. And they were specifically created for that space. And all they need to, con- to do is grab it. And no one can replace them. They simply need to receive the place that's prepared for them. Nobody's going to budge in. Not some good church person that wears a tie on Sunday morning and gives tithes in the offering. They're not going to budge them out of line for their place. We need to help people understand that. So many people don't think they're good enough for the place that God has made for them. And I would tell you, if God says they are, who in the world are we or any other church to tell them it is not their place? Gospel-centered hospitality reminds them of their place, instructs them about their place, and invites them to take their place. Because our place is simply better. Our place together is in the Lord. Because life is simply better. Here's, here's one of the things I heard a preacher say on one of the internet sermons I listen. It's kind of schmaltzy. Keith and I have heard it a lot of time, times, but I want to tell it to you because you need to hear it. If we believe in heaven, and I do, see, the fact of the matter is we're going to be together for a long time. Right? Last time I preached, I said, when we've been there 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun, we've no less days to sing God's praise than when we first began. That's a long hymn. You know? That's longer than a praise song, right? But the fact of the matter is, earthly life is relatively brief. Our life together in heaven is long. And so what this preacher said, you know, it's time for us to get to know each other a little bit better because we're going to be together for each other for a long time. We've got to understand that people of different orientations and inclinations, different skin colors, different languages are going to be alongside us. People of different life situations that don't have as much money as us or have more money than us, that buy stuff more than us or give more to the church, all those kind of things, we're going to be together. And we need to get comfortable with each other now. And the only way we can get comfortable with each other is by offering gospel-centered hospitality in a humble attitude and inviting them and welcoming them and enjoying them into this place. And by this place, I mean the, God, the church of Jesus Christ because we're the body. Oh, we may move from building to building. That church, this church has already done that. But the place of all people is in the body of Christ. And this is what you have. This is what you have. And so we cannot step aside from the responsibility that because we believe And our disciples, we do. We offer gospel-centered hospitality to anyone who has not yet found their place in Christ. And we do it without fear and apprehension because we know how awesome it is to have our own place. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we give you thanks for all that you have given us even to this day. We thank you, Lord that you have given us your gospel. And we ask, Lord, that every day you allow us the courage to practice a gospel-centered hospitality that leans completely and entirely to you and seeks to bless all of those that we come in contact with. Lord, this is basic Christianity. Let us be basically Christian. In Jesus' name, amen.